I have a friend named John. John's probably the smartest person I know. John got like a near perfect score on his SAT. John got a full ride to college. Uh, he's competed on Jeopardy. He's competed on who wants to be a millionaire. And then for his master's degree, the, he went to a major research university that actually paid him to study there. So it's like reverse student loans. I don't know. I didn't have that privilege, but John did. Really smart guy. Now, John didn't become a follower of Jesus until later in his life. He was uh, in his early 20s, in his adult years. And once he became a Christian, I mean, he just voraciously pursued Jesus, just read everything he could. You know, he was a very cerebral guy running to understand this faith. And one day, he asked me a question I had never thought of before in my life, and I didn't have an answer to. And it was a question that bugged me for the next few years because I couldn't find an answer. And his question was this. He said, Scott, do you think the greatest threat to Christianity comes from inside or outside of the church? I don't know. I'd, I'd never considered that question before. So initially, I'm like, oh, that's my gut reaction. Well, there's persecution outside of the church. Oh, but maybe it's false teachers and false teachings inside the church. Oh, maybe it's the devil and his schemes from outside the church. Oh, maybe it's our propensity to compromise and chase false idols inside the church. I don't know. I, I kind of went back and forth different seasons. I'd kind of think maybe this is the biggest problem. Like, no, maybe this is the biggest problem. Until I feel like last year, I feel like I stumbled onto the answer. And the answer is this. It's very boring. The greatest threat can come from inside and from outside the church. But I feel like what the greatest threat is, is throughout the New Testament. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 1 and in Philippians 2. 1 Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 1. The Apostle John talks about it in 1 John 4. And James is going to talk about it today in chapter 4. The greatest threat to Christianity, I believe, is division. It's division. It's when there's a lack of unity a lack of love, a lack of cohesion, a lack of peace inside the church. And that really can come from inside or outside, right? I mean, you can have some circumstances inside a church that are leading to division, circumstances or people that are stirring up division. Or on the outside, you can also have certain influences or experiences that are trying to break you apart. Honestly, I don't think it's any coincidence that this happens to be the text we're getting to in James the week after a flood. There are churches that have split over the color of carpet before. This is something we have to be aware of. We need to be on our guard, I think extra vigilant in this next season against division, that we trust one another, we listen to one another. Because I'm sure whatever we do in here, some of you are going to love and some of you are not. <laughs> That's always going to be a challenge, right? Well, that might become an apparent one in our season that we're about to head into. But this isn't just true for that. This isn't just true for now. I think this is true in all of our relationships. Division is what separates relationships. Division is what separates one person from another. Not only, I think, did the apostles all warn about it, Jesus himself, I think, knew how big of a deal this would be to his followers. In John 17, that's the passage called the high priestly prayer. It's where Jesus, he's about to go to the cross, and he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane, just pouring out his heart to God, sweat and blood. And he says in verses 20 to 23, Father, make them one. He's referring to his disciples and those who are going to believe in their message, which is you and me. Do you know that Jesus prayed for you in John 17? He did. He prayed for you and for me and for all that we would be one. Why? So that the world will know that God sent the Son and that the Son loved the world. So when we are not unified, it harms us because it harms our relationships, but it also harms the gospel message. It harms our witness to the world. When we're not one, it's less evident that Jesus loves the world and that God sent the Son into the world. That's why division is dangerous. It really is. And that's why James is going to spend some time talking about it today. 
chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, analog, digital, or any other kinds, I invite you to meet me in James chapter 4. We'll also have it up on screen, beginning in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Right again, chapter, like James lets you know right at the beginning, the verse as has been want to do so far. Here's where I stand on the issue. I'm going to tell you, first of all, where division comes from, and secondly, how you can restore peace, which is really what we all need. We need to know how peace is destroyed, but then we also need to know how can we get peace back? How can peace be restored? So let's read on. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us? Where does division come from? What causes division? Selfishness. Your selfish desires that battle inside of you. Selfishness is what destroys peace with others. And really, that kind of makes sense if you think about it. I mean, we have desires inside, things that we want. And those are going to be different than what other people want. And that's okay. That's normal. But what happens is we desire something. I think generally the Bible talks about three broad categories we tend to desire. Power, pleasure, and possessions. So we desire one of those things. We desire something so badly that we're willing to compromise. We're willing to negate relationships in order to get them. He says you start to resent people who get in the way of you getting your way. Then you start to hate them. And when you hate them, Jesus says, in your heart, we've committed murder. We desire something so much that we're willing to give up relationships to have it. We're willing to sacrifice other people on the altar of our own selfish desires. We want what we want, and everybody else needs to just get out of the way, right? I mean, that's kind of how you get to division. It's, this is what I want, and you want that, and we're going to clash, and I'm going to win. Enter division. Let me give an example. Who here, raise your hand if you do not want any more money? No one. Okay. So we all want more money. All right. So we all have a desire for more money. Is that wrong? Well, no, not necessarily. Especially when we come to God with very good rational reasons for why we should have more money. God, God, I need a promotion. I need more money because, well, I'll, I'll be able to take better care of my family. And uh, I'll, I'll be able to send them to a better school. I'll be, able to, I'll be able to tithe, of course, to God. Man, I'll give you the full 10% if, you know, you give me more money. I can't afford to right now. But if I had more money, you'd get like the whole 10. Um, you know, God, I'd, I'd maybe help with some of the flooding stuff, you know, separate from the tithe because, you know, that's different. Got to support the church. But we'd help with the flooding. God, all the stuff we could do if, if we just had some more money. So we can ask God with seemingly right motives, but what James says here is God can see right past that. He can look into the heart. He knows whether or not we truly want money for those things or whether we really just want to be able to buy whatever we want whenever we want. He knows. Now, is it wrong to want more money? No. It is wrong to want more money more than you want to love God or love another person. See, the what the power, the pleasure, the possessions becomes more important than the who. It becomes more important than your relationship with God. It becomes more important than your relationship with another person. You allow the what to distract you from the who. And your selfish desires end up destroying your peace. 
Now, God is a generous giver. James has made that point over and over. He said it a couple times already. In James chapter 1, hey, if you lack wisdom, ask God. God gives generously. God is a generous giver. But God is not a genie. You don't like throw in your three prayer coins, pull a lever of faith, and out pops the prayer request you asked for. Like, that's not how it works. Why? Because ultimately, God knows what's best for you. And what's best for you, what's ultimately best for you, is not a what, but a who. It's not a thing. It's not power. It's not pleasure. It's not possessions. What's ultimately best for you is God himself. You need a relationship with him. That's what's most important. And God is going to be hesitant to give you things, to give you gifts that are going to take your attention away from the giver. He's not going to give you what's if you're just going to abuse those in your life and abandon the who. And that's how it is for all of us. He knows the motives with which we ask. Now, is that to say that money and shelter and food and clothing are things we shouldn't care about? Absolutely not. God knows we need those things, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He knows, but we seek first his kingdom, and then all the other things will be added unto us as well. It's about focusing on the who and then getting the what rather than just focusing on the what, on the things that we desire and abandoning the relationship. And in the church, it's not just about money. I mean, that, we do this in other ways. Um, music is one. We have a desire for a certain type of music, and when we don't have that desire met, we can become grumblers. Or we have a desire for a certain type of sermon, and when that isn't given... We can start to stir up some dissension and division. Or we have a desire for a particular ministry or a particular ministry size. And when we don't have that, we'll go somewhere else where we do. It's because our selfish desires can easily get in the way. It happens fast. And this isn't just in the church. This is in all our relationships. If you have division in your marriage... If maybe this weekend is a rocky time for your marriage, ask yourself this morning, what role are my selfish desires playing in that conflict? If you're having challenges with your kids or with your extended family, parents or siblings, pause and ask, God, how am I contributing to this with my desires? Am I focusing on what I want more than on the person? Maybe in your workplace, you're experiencing a lot of problems. Maybe you've got a boss or a colleague or at school, you've got a teacher or a classmate. There's just conflict. Might be worth asking, hey, are selfish desires here a contributing factor? I'm not saying that you're totally responsible. I'm sure the other person is way more at fault than you. I get that. But even if it's 5% of the problem, you'd be willing and able to own that 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 contributes to a lack of peace, our selfishness. I will be the first to say that this can be me, like, all the time. Um, so at my last job, the church I worked at, our whole staff, we took the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. Maybe you've heard of that, the personality test, the MBTI, they stick you in one of these 16 character boxes with four letters. So for those of you who are interested, I was assigned INTJ for my personality. Let me just try and explain that with a word picture. Uh, I saw one that had Star Wars. It was a Star Wars Myers-Briggs, and they assigned different characters of Star Wars to each one. Well, my personality got the evil emperor. <laughs> like, the dark Sith Lord is the INTJ. <laughs> Partially, that's because our personality, my personality type, and apparently the evil emperors, uh, we like to think about things. We like to kind of see the big picture and also get in the detail. We like to think about things. And no matter what we think about, we think we're right. <laughs> right? Like, it's, it's just so easy for the emperor and I to go, yeah, that's not a good idea. I have a better idea. <laughs> and to roll over people, to discredit other viewpoints, to be prideful in what we see or what we think or what we say being the top thing. It's very easy to do. It even happens in my marriage. It wasn't that long ago that Fiona and I were having a fight over, like, we each had engagements we wanted to be at, and so, well, who's going to take the kids? Well, you need to take the kids. No, you need to take the kids. And if any of you have kids, you've had that fight over who's going to take what, when, where, so that who gets to do what, right? 
So we had that fight, and I had to go apologize later because I was a jerk. I did not take her feelings into consideration. It was absolutely a focused on the what and my desires over hers. And my selfishness harmed our marital unity. It harmed our marital peace. So it is in the church. When we're selfish and we allow our selfish desires to take over and to dictate, we harm our peace with others. But we don't just harm our peace with others. James says we also harm our vertical relationship with God. We harm our peace with him. He says here that when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. You misspend what you get on your pleasures. And then he calls them us, the church. You adulterous people. Ow. That's some strong language. And I think James here is echoing the Old Testament prophets who would regularly tell Israel the same thing. Hey, on Yahweh. You are his people, but you're going after Baal. You're going after Asherah. You're going after these Canaanite gods. You've abandoned your God. You've been unfaithful to Yahweh. Well, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ, God's son. And we have marriage vows to him. And when we chase power, pleasure, and possessions rather than him, we substitute the what for the who, we cheat on him. That's the language he uses. We're like unfaithful spouses when we allow our selfishness to take over. Now, in a, a marriage, if one spouse cheats on another, are there going to be some relational ramifications to that? You bet your sweet bippy. <laughs> Absolutely. So it is for us. We can't chase the world, the things of this world, the things we selfishly desire and God at the same time. Got to pick. And in the next paragraph, he, so he, talks, he tells the church we're adulterous people, but then he says, if you're friends with the world, you can't be friends with God. It feels like a bit of a demotion. Like, wait, I thought we were married and now we're just friends? Like, that de-escalated quickly, right? Different metaphor, all right? He's using two different word pictures. The first one is a marriage between Christ and the church. And the second one, he's denot denoting something different than just friendship, See, friendship, that word meant something different in the first century and in ancient Near East than it does today. Uh, the word's a little cheaper today. Uh, I have, according to Facebook, 1,071 friends. Now, how many of those friends could I actually call at two in the morning when my life's falling apart? Not very many. Well, in the ancient Near East, you didn't call someone friend unless that person was incredibly close to you. Friendship didn't just mean relationship. Like we introduce someone like, hey, this is my friend Zach. Zach and I have a relationship. We're a friendship. There, if you said, this is my friend Adam, it would say that Adam and I are aligned. Adam and I are going the same direction. Our priorities, our goals, our values are as one. Friendship meant alignment with the values and the priorities of another person. So he's using here the language of friendship with the world versus friendship with God. You cannot be aligned with the priorities and the values of the world and at the same time be aligned with the values and the priorities of God. Because the values of the priorities of the world are to fulfill your selfish desires. I mean, right? Isn't that the world's message is get it while the getting's good? You got to look out for number one. If it feels good, do it. I mean, it's all about pursuing power, pleasure, and possessions for yourself. But that's not the way things work in the upside down kingdom of God, where the weak are strong and the poor are rich, where those who are in Christ have it all, where people lose their life in order to save it. Those worlds aren't compatible. We can't be aligned with one and at the same time be aligned with the other. Our selfishness, however, when we act in selfishness, we show an alignment with the world. When we allow the desires of our heart to trump everything else, we show an alignment with the world's values, contra 
to aligning with God's values of humility and love and peace. So to summarize, selfishness, he says here, destroys peace with each other and with God. And it's really, selfishness, is, it's such a, such a lie, right? Because your appetites, your desires say, if you just get what you want, if you only had your way, then you'll be happy. That's not where you end up. When you get your way, when you get your selfish desires, you end up separated from God and separated from people. When we give in to selfishness, we end up divided and defeated. When we give in to selfishness, we end up alienated from God and hostile toward each other. And we can see that way back in the Garden of Eden, right? In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve, the very first sin, they choose to rebel against God. God has given them the garden. He's given them the whole world to play in. He gave them one rule. I mean, he gave them so much grace. And they selfishly wanted the one thing God told them not to do. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to make the rules. They gave in to their selfish desires. What happened? They lost their relationship with God. They lost their relationship with each other. They lost the relationship with themselves. They lost the relationship with the rest of creation. Selfishness is dangerous. Selfishness is relational sabotage, if you will. It damages all the relationships when we let it reign in our hearts. And it's a tragic state to be in, is it not? We give in to selfishness thinking we're going to get something, and yet we end up totally alone. Helpless, isolated, alienated. I think a very common example of this in our society today and also in the church is pornography. Pornography holds the allure that says, if you give in to this, you'll be satisfied. You'll have what you want. But like a drug, like anything, like any sin, it's never enough. It's never enough. You keep having to go back. Now, we all have a natural sexual desire inside of us that is God-given. That's normal. But the gift of sex is meant for marriage. And true sex is about giving, not taking. But the sexual desires inside of us that can well up are all about taking for oneself, receiving pleasure. And so, we cross boundaries. We take it outside of where it belongs in a marriage. And when we do, there's serious relational carnage between us and God, between us and our spouse, future or present, does a lot of damage. All because selfish desires promise to give you what you want, but they don't. It's a lie. It is a lie. Selfishness does not give you what you want. It's not the answer. Getting your way is sometimes the worst thing that can happen to you. And honestly, my personal view on hell is that hell is God giving the world its way. God doesn't send people to hell as much as people choose it. They choose to live an eternal existence apart from God. They see his grace and they go, no thanks. I got this. I don't want to give up desiring what I desire and they choose in that the penalty. It's a tragic state. I don't know about you, but when I get to this part in verse 5, I just feel so depressed. <laughs> God, help. I, James, what's the answer? I'll do anything. I don't, I don't want to stay in this state of isolation and division and defeat and hostility. James, how can we get peace back? How can we get unity back? How can we get love back? James, what's the answer? How can peace be restored in our life and in our community? I'm so thankful James does not end in verse 5. But there's verse 6. But he, God, gives us more grace. God has already given us grace and like Adam and Eve in our lives, we've despised it and we've gone our own way. 
And what does God do? He gives us more grace. Wow. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The path to peace is paved with humility. The only way to undo selfishness, the only way to undo division in your relationship with each other and with God is humility. Humility is the answer. Now, humility does not mean thinking like yourself. Many people think that means you need to go stand in the bathroom in front of the mirror and go, all right, you are an idiot. You are dumb. No, that's not humility. That's self-degradation. Don't do that. That's unhealthy. No, humility does not mean thinking less of yourself. It just means thinking of yourself less, as C.S. Lewis said. It just means thinking of yourself less. Humility is, as Tim Keller says, the freedom of self-forgetfulness. It's freedom. You don't have to think about yourself. You're free to not worry about your own desires. You're free to follow God and his desires. You're free to serve and love and care for people and their desires. You seek first his kingdom and everything else will be added unto you as well. The path to peace is paved with humility. And yes, I had to practice saying path to peace over and over again. Now, James, what does that mean? Submit yourselves to God, humble yourself before the Lord. What are you talking about? Well, James here gives five commands, five imperatives that he kind of fires one after the other, kind of round out, I think, the idea of what he means by it. And he says these five things. Resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, and repent sorrowfully over your sin. So there's your to-do list. Just kidding. Because here's the honest truth, none of us can do that. Right? You may think you can, but none of us in our own human power can do even a single one of those. Starting with number one. That one's not going to work out well. The only way any of this happens in our lives is through Jesus Christ. It is only when we come back to the gospel. We come back to the promise that God will reconcile us to himself through Christ and Christ alone. He is the only path to peace. We humble ourselves at the cross and we allow God to fill us with his spirit. Because when we put our faith in Jesus, recognizing that we are sinners and we cannot save ourselves, more effort is not the answer. You cannot earn forgiveness. You can't do any of this. Only God can do this in you. And when you put your faith in Christ, God puts the Holy Spirit inside of you and the Holy Spirit goes to work. He does these things in you and in me. So the answer is not to go try. The answer is to come back to the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do these five things. Let the Holy Spirit empower you to resist the devil. Let the Holy Spirit empower you to come near to God. Allow God inside of you to wash your hands, to purify your hearts. We can't do that to ourselves. We can never be our own savior. That's not the first time and that's not the last time. Anytime we wander from God, it's not like you're saved once, but after that you're on your own. You gotta try really hard. It's all grace. When we are selfish, he gives more grace. When we cause division in our marriage, he gives more grace. When we cause division in our church family, he gives more grace. When we cause division at work, God gives us more grace. The only way this happens is by the power of the Spirit. The path to peace is paved with humility. What we are called to do 
is to humble ourselves before God, to turn over the desires of our heart to the Spirit, to God living inside of us. And we submit our desires to his desires. We submit our desires to the desires of others. We love God and we love people. What the church has done for centuries is to have a time of confession. Now, confession, usually what most people think of is, okay, that means get that list of sins you keep in your back pocket, right? Am I the only one who does that? <laughs> it's not. Um, take out that sins and go, all right, God, I did this. I did this. I did this. Save your breath. God knows you did that. Okay? Like, he was there. He saw it all. And he knows the things you did you didn't put on the list as well. The ones you're like, I don't like that. He knows you did it. Okay, confession, the old English term confession does not mean enumerate problems. The word actually means acknowledge or affirm or agree. It means to acknowledge what we've done. It means to agree with God about what we've done. It means to affirm the truth about who God is and about our sin. I think most people think of confession as, you know, like me and Kaipo, like God on one side, me on the other, and our sin in the middle. And like one by one, we have to get it off the table before we can have a relationship again. But that's not what confession is. Confession is about coming around on the same side and God working on our sin with us. Shoulder to shoulder, attacking the problem. He's on your team. Now that doesn't mean sin's not a problem. Of course it is. And we want to root it out of our lives. We do. God's not opposed to effort. He's opposed to merit. He's not opposed to you trying hard. He's opposed to you trying to earn something with your effort. So the Holy Spirit is going to do his work in you. And of course, that means we put forth some effort. We work with the Holy Spirit working out of us. But that's how we get to these things. It all comes back to humility. It all comes back to humbling ourselves before God. And that is a practice of confession that the church has done for a lot of years. That at the end of this message here in a few minutes, I want to give us a chance to do together because it's important. Before we get there, I want to end with just kind of some practical advice that James ends on. So he's talking here about, so if you notice how he kind of went, he talked about relational problems between people, relational problem between God, fixing the problem between us and God, humbling ourselves before him, and the result of that is that we can now fix the relationships with people up at the top level. See, first we have to fix the hard issue between us and God. We have to repent of our sin. We have to repent of our selfishness. We have to let the Holy Spirit go to work on it. And the result of that is that we are now able to be humble with people as well. We're now able to speak differently. We're able to live differently because of the peace we have with God. It makes sense that peace is going to flow out between us and God's people. It's just natural. I mean, blood relatives and Hanai family are close to our heart, but scripture says that those who put their faith in God, brothers and sisters in Christ, have an even tighter bond. That's going to last forever. It makes sense that all those who've been put into this family, all those who have peace with God, ought to live at peace with one another as much as possible. And I think he gives some practical advice. Hey guys, here's a common way I think in the church, probably more common than any other, that we undermine peace, that we add to division. Here's what he says, verses 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're keeping in judgment on it. Now, I think here he's referring to the royal law back in chapter 2.8, which was the law to love God and to love your neighbor. So that you can't love God and love your neighbor at the same time, be judging everybody like you're on top of them. There's one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But you? Who are you to judge your neighbor? We shouldn't use our words to cut people down. We foster division with our words more than with anything else, which is why it's so important what Pastor Dennis told us a couple weeks ago. We got to watch our words. We got to be careful about what we say. When you're in a conversation with somebody, think, is this something that needs to be said? 
Is this something that's going to help them, build them up, edify them, encourage them? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Does it need to be said? Even more important, though, I think, is to ask yourself the question when that person's not around. Does it need to be said behind their back? Do we need to be talking about somebody else? Here's the grid, all right? Here's when you need to talk to somebody else, here's when you don't. If a person's part of the problem or the solution, talk to them. If they are not part of the problem or not part of the solution, we shouldn't talk to them. It's slander, it's unhelpful information. We're lining someone's character. We're causing someone to look bad. Is that gonna do anything but foster division? Probably not. It's gonna lead down a road that ends in isolation. It's gonna lead down a road of selfishness. But if we wanna have peace with others, the pat path is paved with humility. Where we say, I'm gonna keep my mouth closed, or I don't have all the information, or my way is not necessarily the right way. We listen to others. James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Are there times we need to talk about stuff, serious stuff? Absolutely. But that's not what James has in mind here. This is slander. This is things that don't need to be said that are sometimes said in church, sometimes under the guise of a prayer request. So what's God saying to you this morning? Is there something in a relationship with someone else that might need to be addressed? Or is there a relationship issue between you and God that needs to be addressed? Have your selfish desires maybe been driving the bus a little bit? Either way, the answer is to come back to the gospel. Humble yourself before God and he will lift you up. Humble yourself because it's humility that will ultimately lead to peace in our relationship with God and in our relationship with each other. We gotta humble ourselves. And so to do that together as a church, I would like us to read a confession. So this is something that we'll have up on screen and we'll read together just where you are. Now, there'll be words up here, but it's not the words that ultimately matter. It's a heart attitude. As you come back to God, maybe this is for the 13 millionth time over the same sin issue. That's okay. God's not tired of you coming back to him. He loves you. He knows what you did. He still loves you. Or maybe for you, this is the first time you come to God to receive forgiveness. It doesn't matter. The path is through Christ and putting faith in him and what he has done for you to make you right with God and giving ourselves over to the power of the spirit that he may indwell us because the path to peace is paved with humility. All right, let's read this together. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing self-giving mercy, but we confess that we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. You have called us to seek first your kingdom, but we have looked out for our own interests. You have been generous, and we have been selfish. By our attitudes, our actions, and words, we have harmed our relationship with you and with each other. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we come to you in humility. We repent in spirit and in truth. We admit our sin and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus, our Redeemer. We confess our weakness and inability to live righteously. Thus, we look to the Holy Spirit to fill and empower us to live humbly and generously as you have called us to do in your new kingdom. Help us to love you and to love others. Thank you for your unfailing love, which comes to us through Jesus Christ, our great reconciler. Amen. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, it penetrates. Some Sundays are fun. Some are a little harder. But God, we know your spirit's at work in us. Would you uncover things in our heart that need to be uncovered? God, places where we have allowed our selfish desires to take over. Help us to see, Father, how that's not good for us. How your commands in scripture aren't there to ruin fun, but God, they're there to protect us. They're there because you love us. God, may we be people who live lives that further your glory, your kingdom, and your gospel. God, we give ourselves to you. Would you, Spirit, breed humility in us? In Jesus' name, amen.